in the name of Jesus, in whom all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Dear friends, if you had a video recording of everything that you have done and everything you have said on the first day of the stay-at-home orders a few, a few days ago, and you compared that video to a video of yesterday, what would you learn? Have things gotten better over the past few days, or have they gotten worse? Probably a mixed bag, right? If you like alone time and you like uh, having time with just your family, there's probably been some highlights, but there's probably been a little extra frustration, patience wearing thin, and some low lights. Have you learned anything embarrassing about yourself lately? I just found this uh, on the internet the other day, a recent study that showed that as cases of coronavirus increase and as the stay-at-home orders increase, at the same rate, access to internet pornography increases. It's a little embarrassing for us as people. Has your rate of bitterness increased or bickering or your faithless worry increased at the same rate? You know, many people, when they hear things like that, they, they say that the stress of these days causes us to do bad things. That the falling markets and the anxious nerves and the working from home and the loneliness, those cause us to act badly. But, you know, study after study show that something different is happening. The stress doesn't cause us to act badly. Stress only reveals the bad things that already live inside of us. And that's what the Bible teaches too. The Bible teaches that a good tree produces good fruit when it's time to bear fruit. And a bad tree produces bad fruit. It says this in the Bible. Out of the overflow of a man's heart, his mouth speaks. Someone once paraphrased that verse to say this. Nothing comes out of the mouth of a drunk that wasn't already there when he was sober. And nothing comes out of you and me in day number 14 of quarantine that wasn't already there at the start. Has your bad attitude started to leak out as much as mine? Maybe you've seen your pride recently. If you're sitting on a video conference or you're just talking to your family and you have a thought like, what I do makes perfect sense, but you'd have to be an imbecile to do what that other person You know, the Bible says in the book of Philippians, in humility, consider others better than yourself. It's a little embarrassing. Or maybe you've seen your selfishness leak out of you during these stressful days. When when you know that other people have needs and that they're important, but now is no time to be caring for others. I need to take care of myself. The Bible says in Philippians, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. A little embarrassing. In fact, the book of Philippians says this. It says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And if you've seen, because of the stress these days, you've seen some parts of your attitude that are not so much like Christ Jesus, then we've got a few options. We could just deny the fact that we have a problem, write it off, or we could just ignore it and then just like wait for the stay at home orders to be done and we can go back to regular lives. But neither of those options help us, help us deal with what's on our inside. And so today, here's my good news advice on Palm Sunday, fix your attitude. And if I could come up with some folksy way of saying that, that was real cute, I can make millions. That's what Dr. Phil does, right? Or Judge Judy. Fix your attitude. But just telling you that doesn't do much to help. So how about today we don't focus on ourselves? How about today we don't try to fix ourselves? Instead, we do Palm Sunday. You know, that crowd on Palm Sunday 
that was frantic and crazy. The Bible describes people throwing their coats down and cutting off branches and, and they're all shouting together. Have you, ever, have you ever been in a crowd like that? Maybe at a political rally or at a concert or in a sports arena? Have you ever been there and, 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 and it's so easy to lose yourself, forget about yourself because you're so invested in what's going on. Well, today let's lose ourselves because we're so caught up in what's going on with Jesus. But we're not actually going to look at a, at a story, a, an account of Palm Sunday. Instead, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2, and here's why. Because Philippians 2 gives us x-ray vision. It allows us to zoom in on Jesus. Imagine you're in the crowd on Palm Sunday, straining to get a glance of Jesus, but then your vision can zoom in on Jesus, and he becomes huge in your eyes. And then you zoom right through his outer garment, and right through his skin, and right through everything that human eyes can see, so that you look into the very heart of the Son of God, and you can see who he truly is. And you can understand, what is the attitude of this king? You know that the cloak and the beard and the donkey, those were true about Jesus, but they were covering up another truth about his identity, that he is, in his very nature, God. That's what Philippians says, that Jesus was by very nature God. You know, when a lightning strike comes down to earth, it can be in the inside of that lightning. Fifty thousand degrees Fahrenheit. That's a lot hotter than the surface of the sun. And when that lightning strikes sand in the desert, it can create these glass sculptures. It instantly turns sand to glass and makes these sculptures. Now, who made that sculpture? Jesus did. And do you know, do you know how he did it? You know what it took him? I'm going to show you. Watch this. This is how Jesus does it. Just a thought. With nothing more than a thought, boom, it happens. Why? Because Jesus is by very nature God. 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted in Washington State and 1.5 cubic miles of mountain left. The smoke, the ash from that thing went up 15 miles into the sky, it blocked out the sun. They found ash in Minnesota from an explosion in Washington. Who did that? You know, you look at the before and after pictures, and it's like the mountain is gone. Who did that? Jesus. And you know how he did it? You know what it took him? Just like this. Just a thought, and boom, it happened. Why? Because he is, by very nature, God. And you've experienced that power yourself this morning. Your house is spinning around the world at 1,000 miles per hour. And at 627 this morning, you could not see the sun. But we are spinning so fast that just two minutes later, the entire sun would be visible on a clear day. Who is twirling us around in space right now? It is the one who's riding on the back of a donkey, the one who is on Palm Sunday proclaimed the king. And he is in very nature God. With just a thought, he could have ascended off of that donkey and levitated into Jerusalem 10 feet off the ground. And it would have been true. In fact, it probably would have been an understatement of his power. And then everyone would have honored him and he would have been famous and he could have, he could have shown everybody who he truly is. But what was the attitude of our king? He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Think of Jesus' divine power like a trophy. And if you, if you've ever seen an award ceremony, the, the MC oh, hands this trophy to the, to the recipient and the champion. What do they do? They grasp it and then they show it off for everyone to see. Look what I won. Well, Jesus' trophy is not just best in show or the, the most impressive in the tournament. Jesus' trophy is I am God. And yet he did not show off. Instead, he made himself 
nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. What is the attitude of our king? Not to show off, but to be a servant. And on that Palm Sunday, Jesus could have shed his opaque skin. And he could have shone with the lightning. He could have shone like 50,000 degrees. He'd done it before. He did it at his transfiguration where he showed like lightning. And then everyone would have recognized him. And he would have been famous, the most famous prophet who ever lived. But what was the attitude of our king? He was found in appearance as a man. And he humbled himself. What's the attitude of our king? He's humble. And on that Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And the clever folks in the crowd, they knew what was going on because they knew the ancient prophecy from Zechariah. We read it before. The prophecy that says, your king, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. They knew Jesus was a king. And they had hoped that he would use his power to smash the Romans and set them free. And and with nothing more than a thought, Jesus could have done it. He could have usurped the throne of Pontius Pilate. He could have usurped the throne of, of Caesar in Rome and of every other earthly ruler. And he could have been in charge, calling the shots, doing the world his way. And it would have been true. He really is the king of the world. But what was the attitude of our king? He humbled himself and became obedient. Obedient even to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Did you hear how the Apostle Paul stuttered over his words there? Even death on a cross. You know why he stuttered? Because he was one of the clever ones in the crowd. He knew the prophecy about the cross. He knew it from Deuteronomy chapter 21. When it says anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. That means that when Jesus went up on that cross, Jesus who is God was cursed by God. You realize what that means, that at that moment, God the Father looked at Jesus, his only son, and it's as if he said, what son? I don't have a son. And Jesus died alone. He knew that was coming. And with nothing more than a thought, he could have stopped it all. And yet, what was the attitude of our king? He died for you. He took God's curse for you. He will do anything for you. And because of that, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. You see, when you and I are selfish, when we uh, think that we are better than others, or when we are prideful, when, when we don't look after the needs of others but only our own interests, that doesn't seem like much to us, but it is the worst thing in the entire world. Human sin is the worst thing in the entire world. It is so bad that God does not just whisk it away with nothing but a thought. Now, our sins need to be paid for. They need to be punished. And so God the Son came down. The King of the world came down and became a person. And then he went lower. And he became a servant. And then he went lower. And God became your sin. Your sin died. Your sin died so that I could stand here and with the, with the power of God behind these words, I could guarantee you the only thing that will change your attitude, the only thing that can change your quarantine, because God died as your sin, I can tell you, you have no guilt. You have no guilt. 
Your selfishness is buried in a grave. Your pride is gone because the king paid for it. And God the Father thinks that that is the best thing in the entire world. He thinks that Jesus is the best thing in the entire world and and God the Holy Spirit has spent the entire time of the world telling people about what Jesus has done. They think it's the best. And so God the Father no longer says, what son? I don't have a son. He says, that's my son. And three days after Jesus died, God the Father raised him from the dead. And God the Father looked and said, my son did the best thing in the history of the world. My son has the best story ever. My son gets the best name ever. Here's what Philippians says about it. He says that he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the day is coming when every person on earth and every person in hell and every person in heaven, we will all acknowledge that Jesus is king. He's always been the king. And yet, what did our king do? What was his attitude? He served you. He was humble. He took God's curse. And he will do anything for you. So here's my thought-provoking question of the day. What would it be like to be quarantined with Jesus? Somebody with that attitude, the attitude of our king, what would it be like to live with him? Now, I know Jesus is with you always to the very end of the age, invisibly, right? But what if he was with you visibly, bodily? What if he walked around your house like a member of your family? We could speculate what he would eat for breakfast or how he would play board games or how he would act on a video conference, but we do not need to speculate about Jesus' attitude. He would serve you. He would be humble about it. And he would do anything for you. I know that because he took the curse of God for you. I can't even imagine what it would be like to be quarantined with Jesus, but I can find out. And so can you. I can find out because your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And my attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And we can learn from one another what it's like to live with somebody with that kind of attitude. We learn what it's like to live with Jesus when we do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but in humility consider others better than ourselves. We can learn what it's like to live with Jesus when each of us looks not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. Tomorrow, there is going to be something stressful, or maybe later this week, there's going to be something that squeezes you, And it's going to cause your inside attitude to come out. And when that happens, you're going to want that to be the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus that comes out of you. But in order to have that happen, you're going to need more than just a personal commitment to be nicer. You're going to need a daily Palm Sunday experience where you forget all about yourself because you have seen the King. And so that's why this is perfect timing. It's perfect timing to to spend our time obsessing about Jesus because this whole next week is all about Jesus. On Monday, Thursday, you will see that he is unquestionably God. A mob comes out to arrest him and he knocks them over with nothing but a thought. And yet, what does he do? He goes with them for you. On Good Friday, you'll see that Jesus is definitely God. The whole world went dark when the man died. And yet, what did he do? But he went to that cross for you. And on Easter Sunday, you will see that Jesus is God when he rises from the dead. And what does he do but offers comfort and peace and joy to his followers? See, I don't know exactly what Jesus would do if he were in quarantine with me this week. But I bet on Thursday morning, he would find a computer and he would find the live stream so that he could watch the Maundy Thursday service 
And I'll bet that he would crack open his Bible at breakfast time and he would review the truths of his story with us. I bet he would share with us his, his love, his humility, his service, and his death on the cross so that our attitudes could be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And to that end, may Jesus bless your holy week. Amen.